We'd like to welcome you to the Leighton Heritage Museum Centennial Lecture Series. We've been having these for the last few months. We kind of had to take a break during COVID, but we started back up in the fall. And each month we pick a subject and a person to present that subject. And today our subject is about Verdland Park. If you grew up here in Leighton, you probably heard about Verdland Park. I know my parents actually lived in Verdland Park for a little while after they first got married. And my grandfather actually bought one of the homes, moved it to Kaysville, and lived in it for many, many years. So um, we have with us today Sam Trujillo. And Sam was brought to Layton from Colorado by his parents when he was only eight months old. His father came to work at Hill Air Force Base and, in, and instead became the public housing administrator for Verdland Park. He maintained a crew of workers that did all the maintenance for the housing development, and his family was raised for many years in Verdland Park. Sam's family lived on Wasatch Drive by the corner of Wasatch and Gentile. He attended Verdland Park Elementary School through the sixth grade until it was closed. You can see why he was chosen to present today's lecture. Sam himself worked at Hill Air Force Base and retired as a Chief Master Sergeant. He then worked on the civilian side as a chief of employment and did the training and education for all new employees at Hill Air Force Base. Sam served as a Layton City Council member for six and a half years. And during his tenure, the council approved the building of the Layton Surf and Swim, which was on the property of Verdland Park. Um, Sam and his wife, Joan, have together 12 children and 45 grandchildren. Sam and his brother were heavily involved in sports in Layton and were often called the chain gang of Layton. So let's sit back and enjoy Sam's presentation on Verland Park. Thank you, Joyce. And I want to thank the uh, Layton City Historical for the, uh, for the opportunity to share a few memories I have of living and growing up in the community of Berlin Park. What can I say about uh, the most delightful and pleasing place to live and to grow up in? Now, those of you who have watched the Andy Griffith Show, a television series, Mayberry, well, let me tell you, folks, this is a replica, if not the real Mayberry. As I was mentioning to uh, Joyce and Amy, it was a community where we had a lot of diversity. It was the melting pot, as I see it, in, in a community of this size in Layton. And I think that's what made Leighton really great. We had uh, black Americans, wonderful people. We had uh, Asians, uh, Japanese. And of course, we had Mexicans. And we had Caucasians. I really didn't feel any discrimination at all, maybe once or twice when I was little. But we took care of that. We went out uh, just behind us to the hollow, and we duked it out. <laughs> and the toughest survived. And I walked away with, with just a fat lip, but I'm not going to tell you what happened to the other kid. Glad to see my brothers here. Um, Davey was one of those kids where you, you just, with sports. And all of us kids, that's what we did in the summer, and that's what we did all the time. In fact, uh, in the evening, this was beautiful because you know what? We'd go in and have something to eat, and next thing you know, we're all outside playing again, right here in this area where this building is. And in the winter, we had a sleigh hill, and it was one of the best you could find around. But uh, that was just kind of a little bit of groundwork as to what Verdland Park really was. But on December 7th, 1941, which is also uh, known uh, as the Day of Infamy, and it was probably uh, Davis County's 
most, uh, most historical date, when you look at the economic development of the county and Layton City, it marked the beginning and death of agriculture as we knew it then, and the beginning and rise of the defense industry. And we also had related businesses. It was kind of a little, a little sleepy town. We had a little small market called Adams Market, just, just a little ways down uh, on Gentile here, before you hit uh, Main Street and uh, where the freeway's at now. And we could go in there, our parents would say, hey, we need to have some bread. So we'd go down there and we'd say, hey, my mom needs some bread, can you put it on our, on our bill? And she'd get a little piece of paper out and she'd write it down. Sam to her heel, loaf of bread, boom. So uh, Dave, my brother, talked me into saying, hey, you know what I do when I go down there? I, asked, I say, you know what, mom said I could have a piece of candy too. So I tried that, and she looked at me and she said, mm, are you sure your mom said that's okay? Well, my brother said it was. <laughs> but anyway, it also marks the death of rural living in Layton and began the urbanization of this beautiful and wonderful city. The movement, this movement of the, having Hill Air Force Base, the Naval Supply Depot Arsenal, rose from a population, and this was hard to believe, from 646 residents to over 70,000 as it is today. Layton is wonderful, Layton is great. We're far, we are the, the forefront, forerunners. Harris Adams, I'm, one, I'm so happy you're here. He was a pioneer in helping develop this, this wonderful town. But in 1940, Davis County had two rather small defense industries. They were small, nothing like we have today. And they set up their operations, one, at the Ogden Arsenal. As you go out to the west gate of Hill Air Force Base and go north towards Ogden, you'll see a bunch of uh, buildings down there. They had civilian uh, ramps, but later on they modified that to incorporate the Hill Air Force Base. That's when it started to grow. Then, of course, you had Hill Field, I already mentioned Arsenal Villa. And they were all established in 1921. And the arsenal was a place where they stored bombs and shells that were left over from World War I. Hillfield was a fledgling military air base and it was completed in 1940. With the outbreak of World War II, these two facilities became important to the national war effort. Most of the facilities that you will see and look at even today were situated around coastal areas. And the reason for that is it's easy to uh, ship uh, ordnance materials to Europe or to the world. But during that time, they, they thought, Wait, we better be careful because it's possible that the Japanese could invade the United States from California. So the, 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 the thinkers and the dreamers in the Defense Department said, we need to go inland. And I'm so grateful because they picked Utah as to be one of them. Sequestered between the mountains, difficult to get here, and easily to defend. So we have Hill Air Force Base, and we had some other facilities that were important to the war effort. Now, here's the good part. Um, when all of that happened, and they started building Hill Air Force Base. We then had, the, they built the, the Naval Supply Depot. And then we also had the arsenal, which was already established. And it's interesting because when they shut down the Naval Supply Depot, they, um, what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with all these buildings? What are we going to do with all this, this infrastructure here? Thank goodness we had some very smart, forward-looking individuals uh, in our community. Haven Barlow was one of them, who said, hey, you know what? We ought to purchase this from the federal government, the naval supply area that down there. And we now it is now the Freeport Center. Unbelievable. In December of 1941, Layton was a small quiet farming community. 
we had an insignificant population, and the farms in the incorporated section, as we know today, was West Layton. But we were scattered, our Layton, scattered from the mountain foothills to the shores of the Great Salt Lake. Layton's downtown merchants, however, boasted the presence, the presence of a bank, a flour mill, a sugar company, and uh, of course, we had J.C. Penney's. We even had, we even had a movie theater, the Rialto. Of course, Cali Drug. How can we forget that? All the super great malls. We had two drive-ins: Davis Drive-in and Layton Drive-in. We had two unbelievable drive-ins. Dipper. I'll tell you what. We as, we as teenagers hung out there a lot. And my brother got a lot into trouble over there. And not to forget Little Joe's. Best hamburgers, best hamburger steaks in the world. And I've traveled a lot around this, this, this country and world, and you're not going to find anything better than his food. Um, transportation through town consisted of a two-lane highway. We had Highway 91, which we used to call Mountain Road, and then there was the and it, that was the main road between uh, Ogden and Salt Lake. We had railroads. We had the Union Pacific, Denver Rio Grande, and of course we can't of course we can't forget the Bamberger. We as kids used to go put pennies on that on the tracks there, and after the tracks after the train went through there, we'd run over to see if our pennies got smashed. Yep. Most of them did. When uh, Hillfield was designated as one of the principal air material bases in the Western United States, of course, the number of available jobs really skyrocketed. In the early years of the war, Hill had over 2,000 jobs. But they couldn't fill them. And here's the reason why. We didn't have anywhere to house them. Not enough homes, not enough even places to rent. So here we are, we're stuck. Ogden, Layton, Kaysville, Clearfield, as I mentioned, had few places. 38 days after Pearl Harbor, representatives from the Federal Public Housing Authority came out here to look for places. So grateful, they looked at, looked at the lands around, but they decided here at Hill Air Force Base. On May of 12th of 1942, an 85-acre acre site was found in Layton. But these, uh, this, this property was owned by some pretty wonderful people. And I think they went up to him and asked him if they wanted to sell him. Of course, they says, no, you know what? This is good grazing ground for my, for my cows, dairy farms. And I remember wheat and growing right down there where Winco was. I mean, you look out to our, our home on B1, and it was just nothing but farmland. Well, the federal government came in and used what we call eminent domain, and they condemned the property. And they offered the landowners, John Green, Leo Green, who I used to go over and play with his cows and help him and do a lot of things, Abe Higgs, Alta Rosenkamp, and Joseph Wiggle. Wonderful people. I remember meeting them. Now, they were paid a big sum of money, a whopping $281.59 an acre for their land, a total of $23,934 was spent to purchase uh, Fernland Park. Slide number six shows, sorry, Amy. Are you going to change the slides? This, okay, we'll get to that. This slide shows the layout of Fernland Park. 
It was laid out in courts and, of course, cul-de-sacs. Courts were labeled A through N, P. I forgot, I forgot P court. It was this small court right, right behind us here. And they were laid out on both sides of what came to be called Wasatch Drive, and it hooked on to Gentile. The neat thing about this, and I had to remember because I remember these, we had single homes and we had a lot of double homes. But it, came, it contained, Verland Park contained between six, which was the smallest, those were single homes, 42 were the largest units. And I mentioned to, to you before that the roads in and out of here were from start of Gentile at the corner of B1 where we lived all the way around here and out to Fort Lane. Of course, uh, Lane being very progressive, all we had was dirt for roads. And then somebody figured out, hey, we ought to put some gravel down. And then later on, the city council says, you know, I think we've got enough money now we can put down some, uh, some asphalt. In Verland Park, as I mentioned, it was really fun to be in. I already mentioned the, day, the, the uh, Bamberger Railroad. It was a major uh, uh, kind of uh, transportation, part of transportation, kind of like, a for, like the front runner today. I have from Salt Lake to Ogden. And uh, that's how a lot of the uh, military workers would, uh, would get to work. Next slide will show the park units, which, is, which Amy has done it in the back. Here's the interesting part. They were prefabricated. Um, barrack style. Now, if you don't know what, a, what barrack style is, it was, a, it was a big, long home like this. You had a family living on this side and another family living on the other side. So they were kind of like looking at each other. But there was a partition in the middle. There were, uh, there were over 400 units. Two units were reserved for the government for educational purposes. Elementary school, Verland Elementary School, almost right here where we're sitting. The other uh, 398 were rented to individual families. Each unit had a, uh, had a small porch entrance and they came as one or two or three bedroom homes. We were lucky we had two. But I'll never forget in 1949, we had a vicious snowstorm. Remember I, I mentioned the ports, porches? That snow between the falling snow and the wind blew right up to, the, to our doors. Got up that morning, tried to open the door, and we did, there was a big pile of snow. I remember my dad having to get a shovel, climb over it, and came right up here to the maintenance area. And we didn't have really any snow plows at that time. So uh, people got together and they started pushing snow. It was just amazing. Two units, there, for the 400 units, Two units were reserved by the government for, as I mentioned to you, for government purposes, for educational purposes. And the other th 398 units were for individual families. Each unit included a living room. It wasn't, you know, it, was, it wasn't that big, 12 by 12. Had a kitchen, a bathroom, and a bedroom. Well, let me tell you what, the kitchens were really not like they are today, but they were functional. And uh, rent for one bedroom unit was $21.50. A two bedroom unit, this is pretty cool, it went for 24, doubled it. And a three bedroom unit was for 31.50. The buildings were off the ground, elevated on brick pilings. At each corner, there was about a three foot crawl space under each unit, which most residents used as additional storage space. Well, what we, kid, we kids did, we had friends up here and uh, we were down here in A court and we wanted to go up to uh, C court. We used to run underneath those houses. It was a lot of fun, couldn't be seen. The units were painted either pink, peach, 
gray, or olive drab. <laughs> and under and, in, and another thing, below those homes, the crawl spaces, oh my gosh, there were all kinds of bicycles hid under there. Uh, car parts, you name it, it was underneath there. The next slide. Well, sh Oh, okay. Yep, just right there. Perfect. Got it. There you go. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. You can tell that's a, that's a small mic here. Let me see where I'm at here. Help me out here. There's the layout. There are the home. That's the double home I was talking about. If you look right there behind the... Uh, the two windows, they'll split right there. That's a pretty good picture, huh, Dave? Now there's the kitchens. And see the sinks there? That was pretty cool. We're going to talk about this right now. It had, uh, had a deep bowl on one side, and it was called a wash utility sink. One side of the sink had a deep bowl that could be used as a drain for the park's portable washing. Let me tell you, we didn't, we didn't know what washing machines were because most of them uh, were just hand washing. The other thing I remember is on wash day, you'd come up here and you would see clothes hanging out all over the place. And we kids sometimes uh, would uh, like to run underneath them and feel the, feel the sheets in that. Uh, one time my brother would, had his hands dirty, would wash the, and it, oh my gosh, did he get in trouble after messing up her, her sheets. It also had a wash, that, uh, washing machines had to be checked out from the utility department. And then the water had to go somewhere as you washed the clothes, so you had two sinks. You had a hose that you also had to borrow from the utility department that ran into the next sink. The kitchen also had a small gas cooking stove, a water heater, and an ice box. That was so cool to have those ice box in there. Refrigerators were extremely difficult to find, even to have, because of the war effort. There's the bathtub. The living room measured about 12 by 12 with a hardwood floor. And let me tell you, those hardwood floors were beautiful. And I remember uh, as I got a little older, put wax on it and polished it up. They're just beautiful. Don't have that today. They, as I mentioned before, the, they were prefabbed units, had a hardwood floor, and they served both building units and the individual units were heated by a single gas space heater. About this time of year, folks, we had that one heater, and I remember getting up, we had to get ready to go to school. It was kind of cool in the bedrooms. We'd all run, stand around that, that one little heater that was sitting there in the bathroom, all around that heater, just standing there trying to get warm, and then we'd run and get in our clothes. With time, Dad finally decided that furnaces would be better, and they were added. The entrance to the rental unit was through a front door that opened into the living room. The bathroom included a toilet, a wash basin sink, and a medicine cabinet, and a bathtub. Now, those of us today, we have these nice, really nice porcelain bathtubs with all the neat, shiny stuff on it. Well, back then, the bathtub was nothing more than a cement bathtub painted white inside. Now, as kids uh, played in, and with time, over time, the paint would chip away. But that was not a problem, because all they had to do is just come up here to the um, utility department and pick up some paint. And not only that, we had, uh, how, how are we going to mow the lawns? There was a lot of lawn in this, in this facility here. And I remember we used to have to come up and check out the lawnmower. And if you let that lawn get a little too high, I'm telling you, 
I would be behind it, pushing it like this, okay, and my little brother was dead right down behind, beside me, leaning down, helping me push. I was a smart one. I made him bend down and do it. With time, the pain, as I mentioned to you, and, and we had them on, um, in order to the park, uh, in order to rent the park, a family member had to be employed at one of the uh, military establishments. And the park has, thank goodness, started to fill up with tenants. And in January 1943, Unit B, off Gentile, was the park's temporary administration building. Alan Strong was the park administrator, and Ralph Rampton acted as the assistant. I think I did that. Yeah, there you go. We got to know Ralph Rampton really well because uh, uh, my dad worked alongside of him long hours. When Alan was promoted to a different job, as I mentioned too, Ralph Rampton became the parks administrator, and my dad was also the maintenance superintendent. So if anything went wrong, he was the one that had to fix it. And, and, and uh, labor wasn't there readily. So a lot of farmers, you went out and asked for a lot of farmers, and you know what, they knew what they were doing also, came and helped. This slide shows uh, Verlin Park as it looked in 1960. By then, we had really started to grow in Layton. Mm -hmm. Verdon, Verdon Park became Layton's first concentrated res residential area in 1943 with approximately 1,450 residents living very, very close together. Mm -hmm. The rest of the community was still made up of isolated farms. West Layton was still West Layton. East Layton was still somewhat East Layton. I guess part of the farms that they d didn't uh, farm up in East Layton was because you found too many rocks. Verdon Park was officially dedicated on December 20th, 1943. At that time, we had George Briggs. He was the town board president. I guess that would be considered the mayor then. Huh? And he had several government officials who he welcomed to look at the park, at the, the Layton. At first, Verlin Park was not officially part of Layton. Layton, uh, if I remember right, was uh, broken up into three areas. We had Ver Layton City proper, then you had East Layton, then I think you had a little uh, parcel out there that was called Laytona. Is that right, Harris? Great. But the 85 acres that we're sitting on was annexed to the city in May of 1944. A survey was conducted in February of 1944 that showed that 682 men and 768 women were living in Verland Park. It was amazing. And that was fun because we ate really well. Verland Park had, as I mentioned to you, the population of 1,450. This figure almost doubled the number of people living in Layton. And uh, the Verland Park residents were firmly established at the three uh, military installations. Now, in summer of, of 1943, the Park Administration Building, as I mentioned to, to you, was pretty much right about here, maybe a little bit farther back. But anyway, we had an elementary school, which was built in the center, right, right in this area, right here. And the maintenance building included a large maintenance, maintenance room to, to store all of the lawnmowers and washing machines, you name it. It had a kitchen in it and a recreation room. That was, that was really a cool place. But if when, when I was a little kid, it was, to me, it was very big. And of course, the recreational hall with a stage. These items, all of the tools and that, that those are just cool. The recreation room was used for civic meetings, city council. And it had also had other activities. Groups like the Boy Scouts, arts and crafts were used there. It was also um, the Park Civic Center. Uh, 
uh, where we held uh, dances and we had uh, we, we prepared dinners and snacks for various programs. And let me tell you, when we had a festivity here and we all invited the whole community, I'm telling you what, it was potluck. You could have a feast. Not only did we have ham, ham and potatoes, but we had just all kinds of Japanese food, uh, barbecue from the south, and of course the best was Mexican food. This is the administration building. There was a lot of people that worked there. This, of course, is the uh, community hall. You see all the little kids in there. As we, uh, like that. And th there you see this, the uh, sleigh hill. And then there's the kids that we, uh, I went to school with. We had a lot of working mothers. And then we decided that since there was a lot of mothers that were uh, working, the, the uh, forefathers here decided we needed a preschool. We needed some place for the mothers to drop off the children. So there was this preschool run by Ruth Malin, and she was hired to oversee all of that. A three-bedroom unit was set aside for this, for the, the school, I mean, for the uh, daycare center, and mothers took turns helping keep the center going. The grade school, we started out with a student population of 218 kids, grades from K through 6. And I think I went a little too far. Let me go back. And here's some pictures of some of us uh, in school. As you can see, what a diversity. And then we have some school activities. Let me find them. Whoop, I went too far. There's the dancing. Well, anyway, we had a lot of fun activities up there. Now, let's go to uh, post-war. Uh, Ruby Price, fantastic citizen. I am not kidding you. She was unbelievable. She was uh, African-American, and she ran a really tight ship in school. She became the first African-American teacher and I think we have a picture of her. Let me, let me try and find it. There she is. After the war ended in 1945, the, uh, the Berlin Park was still maintained as a military housing unit. And many, many new married GIs had their first home here in Berlin Park. But in 1956 and 1957, things started to change. And that's when uh, people decided that, hey, you know what, I can find something else in that. But I wanted to mention and show you this picture here of Ruby Clark. Uh, I'll talk about her in a minute. But anyway, the, uh, the um, federal government decided, hey, um, it's time for us to sell that. And in 1957, Lake City purchased this area, the 85 acres. The city paid $580,000 to the federal government, and, but, and, and also the city then decided to continue to operate the park as a rental unit for the general public. Elias Dawson was Layton's mayor. City council members were Jim Briggs, Dick Adams, Richard Stevenson, Richard Cook, and Dean Morgan. By 1962, the plywood units were in such bad shape that they couldn't be saved. It was just weather and just all kinds of things that were happening, and they just couldn't be saved. So they put a, together a committee made up of Haven Barlow, Wendell Snow, G.W. Fairholm, Harris Adams, Hal Marcel, Roy Sims, David Sandel, 
and Oma Wilcox. I think, Harris, you've outlived them all, haven't you? And we're glad you're here. This committee recommended that all of the units between were, should be taken down or sold. Boy, let me tell you, folks, there was a lot of lumber, a lot of plywood. Since they were prefabricated, they could be they could be purchased for two hundred seventy dollar a unit. Now that's pretty cool. Remember, I told you they had a three foot crawl space. Well, these big movers would come in with their trucks and their their flatbed traders, get these big uh, 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 metal steel pipes, went through them, go in there with a with a lift, lifted them up, put them on that, and away they go. We see a lot of a lot of these homes were uh, were taken and uh, refabbed, remodeled, and they really turned out to be really nice homes. So anyone, you can purchase that for $270, or at this time, the city sold. And then, city fathers were pretty smart. They sold 28 acres to Davis County School for $3,000 an acre. Made a little money. This site now is where Layton High is and our Commons Park. But where Layton High is, as you go further down, where the soccer field in that, it was a little uh, kind of a uh, slew-like area. And we kids would go and we'd find some of these cardboard, I mean, some of the boards that they would left, and we'd put them together, tie them together, and we'd raft out there on that little, little pond out there. Well, we got caught doing that, and the results, they weren't really cool worrying about us kids drowning. Well, as I'm showing you now, Ruby Price spearheaded a drive to place a Verlin Park Memorial uh, rock in the Layton Commons Park. And you can see this down on the south side of the entrance to Heritage Museum. And it's very memorable. So, this is today. The site of Old Verlin Park. It's a home, as I mentioned, City Hall, Commons Park, and Layton High School. In conclusion, growing up in Verlin Park was unbelievable. It was awesome. We had a school, a community center where we could go and see plays do arts and crafts, play basketball, baseball. We had a beautiful white church just behind us, B1. Never was late for church. Of course, my mom made sure of that. And as I mentioned to you, it was similar to Mayberry, a place where everybody knew everybody and everybody took care of everybody. It was fun to smell clean clothes drying in the breeze where we could stay out after dark and then hear our mom, hey, it's time to come in. And we knew each mother's voice. Sorry, LeVar, you got to go home. Or if we didn't come home, then dad showed up. He had a whistle. I remember that whistle. This is time to come in. Elementary students trading lunches. I never knew then what ham sandwich was. I liked it. Ah, but when they tasted my scrambled eggs, refried beans, and a tortilla, breakfast burritos, I got a lot of lunches. <laughs> it was where the town sheriff, if we were caught doing something wrong, he wouldn't haul us off or do nothing. All he had to say was, listen, I catch you doing this again, I'm going to tell your dad. <laughs> and every one of us, all of the kids in Verlin Park, when we knew that, we were straight arrows. Except my little brother, he forgot sometimes. I remember running, as I mentioned to you, around and just having fun. This, this hollow behind us, oh my gosh. How many times did we have little thinking like we were uh, 
Tom Sawyer. And we'd grab whatever we could and we'd go out and build a little fire down there and we'd cook our little chili or whatever it was. We ran out and rode our bikes all over the place without helmets. Sleigh riding on hills where the Layton's Comet Park is today. Oh, what memories. Thank you, Ms. Bonner, for letting me share just a little bit of our Mayberry World Park. Thank you, Joyce, for that wonderful introduction. And it has been my pleasure to be here to share my memories and some of the memories of those who lived here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. That was fantastic. It was great to hear all of your stories. We all really enjoyed it. Um, and we would like to also thank Layton City Ramp for making the recording and putting up online of this possible. So thank you, Ramp. And also next month on March 4th at noon, we will have Ted Ellison. He will be speaking about the Layton Sugar Company. So make sure that you guys make it to that one too. Have a great day, guys. Thank you. Thank you.